who believe the Bible is true. God made the world in six days. The evolution theory is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, the last chapter of the book of Luke, talking about the resurrection of Christ. Let's sing about it first. <clears throat> Ready? <clears throat> Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up to the grave he arose, through the mighty triumph for his home. He arose a victor from the dark cold pain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Amen. Thank you, brother. We got a lot to cover this morning. <clears throat> and we got to get to the Chinese restaurant early, of course, you know, so we get to, uh, don't have to wait in line 400 years. Let's see. There's a lot of good verses to that song. Uh, let's see. Oh, right here. Any visitors this morning? It's raining like crazy. It started about midnight raining. No. The lake is way up. It's going through two spillway pipes. We have six spillway pipes. Uh, it's going through two of them, so... I hope we're ready for the big one. All right, let's see. Uh, Alan, okay. If you preach, teach, or Sunday school, or anything else on the book, and you'd like all my slides I've done, they'll be ready after today's Bible study. <clears throat> and if you want to help support our ministry, go to uh, drdino.com and join our 777 Club. Totally voluntary, totally, uh, we don't check up on anybody. If you want to join, fine. If you want to quit, fine. To ask folks if they can to donate a dollar a day to keep us open for free. We have people visiting from all over the place. I had fun giving tours yesterday. I love that. <clears throat> Jeff, did you see the fish that guy caught? Yes. I should have put the picture up here. A bunch of guys came fishing yesterday right by Jeff's cabin, caught a seven and a half pound bass, a five pound bass, and a four pound bass right there by your cabin, brother. Have you been feeding them? Yeah, every day. You throw it. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> Come fishing at Dinosaur. I'll put the pictures up for next time. <clears throat> Make any checks to CSE. Okay. Uh, the Old Testament is everything before Jesus came from the creation up until Jesus came, which was about a 4,000-year period. And then Jesus split history right in two, and we start our time of our clock, our calendar over at the birth of Jesus. It should be at the resurrection probably. But the New Testament is everything after Jesus came. And so first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, are the Gospels, the good news, the story of Jesus' life, the biographies. We're all about to finish up the book of Luke, and then next Luke wrote the same. He was a medical doctor. He wrote the book of Acts, and we'll go into Acts after this. So let's see, slide number 1395. Did I get it right? Wow. <clears throat> all right. We ended last, uh, last time with the last verse uh, of the Luke chapter 24 where they came to the tomb, and the tomb was empty. <clears throat> Here's Luke 24, verse 1. I apologize for the throat. <clears throat> My mom had this phlegm on the uvula for 40 years, never could lick it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher. <clears throat> I've been pronouncing that wrong all my life. Sepulcher. Sepulcher. Who cares? Okay bringing the spices which they had prepared. See, Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. Thursday was a Sabbath for the Passover. Friday was the day of preparation where you got to cook six meals to get ready for the Saturday Sabbath. That's why Friday was a day of preparation. So they prepared all the meals for the next day when they couldn't cook on Sabbath day. And <clears throat> they prepared the spices for the body of Jesus. These were some busy ladies, okay? And certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? What a thought. <sighs> okay. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? Here's these two probably angels saying, hey, ladies, don't you remember he told you this was going to happen? 
He told you they're going to crucify me and I'm going to be dead for three days and I'm going to rise again. He told you. Don't you remember? You know, we need things to remind us all, all the time. You got a wedding ring on to remind you of some promises you made. You see little things around the building that remind me, well, thank you, God, for protecting me when that happened. Or thank you, God, for providing. I see every time I drive up to this property, it's a reminder of the, just the amazing mercy of God. Came from prison with absolutely nothing. Didn't own a pair of socks. And God is blessed beyond comprehension. Jeff, you've seen it grow for three years now. Isn't it phenomenal? A mind boggling. So there ought, to have, there ought to be things in your life that remind you. <clears throat> we covered that in the book of uh, uh, Joshua, talking about the stones. They set the stones up there at the edge of the River Jordan. That's another story. Okay. <clears throat> Saying, verse 7, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. The angels are saying, hey, ladies, remember he told you? Verse 8, And they remembered his words. How many of you have ever been discouraged or down in the dumps or worried or nervous and all of a sudden you remembered something and said, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. God will take you. Okay. And returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Remember, the eleven disciples are hiding for fear of the Romans. They thought, oh, no, they killed Jesus. Now they're coming after us. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna the and Mary, the mother of James. Now, there are six different Marys in the Bible, and it gets a little confusing. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, the mother of James. Anyway, that's another whole story. <clears throat> Which told these things unto the apostles, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Remember, they're hiding in it to get away from the Romans. And the women come in and say, hey, guys, the tomb's empty. He's gone. Yeah, right, right, sure. They don't believe it. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, <clears throat> and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, two of them went, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. That's about seven and a half miles. And they talked together all these, of all these things that had happened. Emmaus is in the New Testament a couple of times. It's right, let's see, there's Jerusalem and there's Emmaus up at, toward 10 o'clock on the map there, <clears throat> about seven miles. <clears throat> and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. This third guy walks right up and starts walking along beside him. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him, so they did not know it's Jesus. So Jesus, they're walking along the road. He just kind of joins in with them. Hey, guys, what are you talking about? He said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one with another as you walk and are sad? This is Jesus talking. Hey, guys, why are you sad? What are you talking about? And one of them, <clears throat> whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And has not known the things which are come to pass there these days? And he said unto them, <clears throat> What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also <clears throat> of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. So they went to the sepulcher, found this huge stone rolled away. By the way, Richard Reeves up in uh, WyattMuseum.com in Cornersville, Tennessee, he was over there looking at the sepulcher, and he had been doing a lot of studying on how do the Romans seal a tomb? Because the guy, the uh, general or uh, centurion or whatever, had told the soldiers, Put him in that tomb and seal it. Well, the Romans, when they would seal something, they would drill a hole in the rock, put a pin in there, and surround it with lead, and <clears throat> so you couldn't move the stone back. <clears throat> Uphill. Uphill, right. So Richard went over there, and he's looking at the tomb, and he saw the, the stone was taken years ago to England, to a museum. I think I don't know if they put it back or not, but it may still be in England. But he noticed this spot of lead on the, on the side to the left of the, of the grave opening. I've been in the tomb myself. 
And <clears throat> he asked the, the people who take care of the t- garden to him. He said, what is this? He said, oh, it's probably a bullet from, you know, they fight all the time over here. Probably a bullet got stuck. So he had to go through all kinds of red tape to, to see if I could, he could drill a hole in the bullet to see, analyze it. They said, well, you can drill one hole only. So he's thinking, how do I tell if there's steel in the middle of this lead to see if it was a Roman pin? So the thought came to him, hey, I'll drill at an angle. I'll go through at an angle through this thing, and I'll go maybe the lead, steel, lead. So he taped an envelope, regular mailing envelope, under it, and very carefully drilled a hole at an angle, and it came, it went through lead and then steel and then lead. So it was a steel case inside a lead shield. You can talk to Richard about that, Richard Reed. But <clears throat> he said that was definitely a tomb that the Romans sealed. And it's always been the tradition that that's the spot where Jesus was buried. Anyway, <clears throat> plus the, the stone was uphill. Very heavy stone. There's no way these women could have moved it anyway without the seal. And these women, he said, when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Keep in mind, they're talking to this stranger walking with them, thinking he's just some stranger, doesn't know what's going on. They don't know it's Jesus. There have been many, many sermons preached on this called the road to Emmaus. For that seven-mile journey, what a conversation that would have been. And he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter? Don't you guys know Jesus was supposed to suffer? See, here's the problem. God is perfect and, and he's just. He has to judge every single sin. But we've all sinned. And he loves us. So there's a little bit of a conflict, like, okay, how do I fix this now? You all deserve my judgment. Your sin, you deserve to go to hell, but I still love you. I would like to fix this. So God himself became a man and took the judgment on him so that we can be forgiven. So his, his mercy is fulfilled and his justice is fulfilled. If you burn the neighbor's house down and they said, look, you owe us $200,000. And you say, I don't have $200,000. And <clears throat> uh, Skyler comes along and says, hey, Joe, I don't want you to go to prison for burning the house down here. I got $200,000. Here's right side of check. Hold, stands there and holds it for $200,000. I'm next. Or, okay. <laughs> so Joe has a choice to make. Am I going to accept his gift and take make the payment and get out of trouble or reject it? Now, the owner of the house doesn't care where the money comes from. He wants $200,000. He don't care if it's yours or comes from the man in the moon. So <clears throat> that's kind of the way it is with, uh, we have a sin debt. We owe God eternity in hell. But he <clears throat> chose to die in our place to offer us forgiveness. And if you accept it, fine. If you don't, okay. The debt's going to be paid, either by you or by Jesus. <clears throat> so they're explaining to, Jesus is explaining to these guys, didn't you know he had to suffer these things? I'm thinking about uh, he's saying, "Oh, you fools, full of heart, you believe not that the prophets yeah. have spoken this." But in the early churches and even back then, they didn't have the Bible like we do now, so they'd only got uh, snip clips. <coughs> Whenever they'd go to the synagogue, they'd only read a little bit at a time. They didn't. They didn't each have a copy of the Bible. Yeah, but that they. That's <coughs> why they were blinded. But now. God's bringing to the remembrance all them little bits they've heard in the synagogue right. and putting it. That could be. <clears throat> so here's Jesus talking to these guys and saying, don't you guys know? You've been reading this book all your life. Don't you know? <clears throat> so Jesus talking to the guys on the road. <clears throat> and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He started to show it to them. And they drew nigh into the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. Remember, a couple nights, three nights earlier, he had broken the bread and passed it out. Thank you, brothers. That's something for the throat. 
Arsenic yeah. cures everything. What? Is there a flavor to that? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so they constrained him and said, "Oh, don't don't keep walking. Stay here. Stay, spend the night with us." So he broke the bread and gave to them, <clears throat> and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Strange passage, but that's what it says. <clears throat> and they said one to another, <clears throat> did not our heart burn within us? This is called holy heartburn. <laughs> while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened us the scriptures, so you guys are talking, wasn't there something burning inside while he was talking? Yeah. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. So they're going to walk seven and a half miles back. And they found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. In other words, hey, we watched him break the bread and pass it out. We said, whoa, this is him. How many of you have ever had something in your life where you didn't realize it was God doing something until it was almost over and just about done? Said, Whoa, that was God did that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <clears throat> and as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Now, if you read the other Gospels, I forget if it's Matthew or Mark, they were in the room and the door was locked. And all of a sudden, Jesus is standing there in the middle of them. You think a locked door is going to keep him out? <laughs> And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. It's interesting, almost every time God appears to somebody in the Bible, the first words, or some of the first words are, Fear not, or relax, calm down, it's fine. Muhammad said when the angel appeared to him, it would choke him. Try to put fear into him. Their whole religion is based on fear. Christianity is based on peace. Yes. Uh, why, do you, why do you think they, the disciples didn't recognize Jesus when he appeared to them? On the don't know. One reason is <clears throat> he looked like an ordinary human being. There was nothing special about him. There was no form or comeliness that we should desire him. He just an ordinary, looked like an ordinary guy, uh, Middle Eastern. Plus, the last time they saw him, he was bleeding and all beaten. True. He'd been beaten and beard ripped out. and uh, Yeah. So he appeared in the middle of them. <clears throat> But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Hold it. What did he say? Flesh and bones. He didn't say flesh and blood. His blood had been shed. He was flesh and bones. There's a whole sermon in there. <clears throat> now, if you read the other Gospels and synthesize them all together, Thomas before had said, I won't believe he's alive until I put my finger in the hole where they nailed him. So Jesus said it during this time in the upper room, okay, Thomas, come here, put your finger in the hole. So apparently he still has the holes, probably even today. Now, the Roman custom was when they nail somebody up to nail through the wrist bones right there. Because if you nail through the hand, it just rips right out. They've done studies with that where they just nail a corpse up to a tree. Through here, it just rips the skin right out. Nail through the wrist right here. How many tendons and how many? Seven carpal bones. There's a space called espasta esto. I don't know if you studied that in anatomy school to be a doctor. Right below the ring finger, these seven carpal bones, there's a little space between this one right under this finger. That's where the Romans would nail. So it hits the radial nerve. So you're hanging there on this nail, rubbing against the bone and rubbing against the nerve, and it would cause the thumb to pull in. And, of course, the pain would be excruciating, which is what they're trying to do. As much pain as possible before you die. Yep. That's where that word comes from, excruciating. Excruciating, yep. The, so yeah. when they, the uh, shroud of T Turin, <clears throat> that some people think is the burial shroud of Jesus, kind of showed up in the 13th century. So whether it is or not, I don't know. But I read extensively on that. I think it probably is. It shows a, a body with the hands crossed and the thumbs are pulled in, which would have been what happened from the crucifixion. Anyway, he said, Thomas, here, go ahead, stick it in. Here, Thomas, here's where the spear went in. Put your hand in there. 
But <clears throat> Jesus is talking to that. That's not recorded in Luke. It's in one of the other Gospels. He showed them his hands and his feet. <clears throat> and while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what separates Christianity from all other religions. None of the rest of them have, some of them have good teachings, good moral standards, that's fine. But <clears throat> About 33% of the world claims to be Christian in some flavor or other, okay? 21% 21, 21 claim to be Islam, followers of Muhammad. Then there's Hindus and all kinds of... See, Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon religion, he died in 1844 in Nauvoo, Illinois, was shot, you know, trying to escape from jail, and he's still dead. He didn't rise from the dead, did he? Muhammad, the founder of the Muslim religion, died in 632. He's still dead. Buried right there in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Confucius, the founder of Confucianism, died in 479 B.C. He's still dead. Yep. Can you give like a tiny, quick brief of what Confucianism is? They're confused. <laughs> <coughs> okay. <laughs> Prince, uh, Prince Zidhartha, better known as the Buddha, started a religion. He died in 400 B.C. He's still dead. He's buried there in China. Blavatsky, Helena Blavatsky, started the New Age Movement religion, the Theos Theosophical Society. She died in 1891. She's still dead. Her ashes were divided up between New York, London, and India, where some of the ashes are interred under her statue right there in India. She didn't rise from the dead. Karl Marx, the founder of the communist philosophy, which in many could be easily classified as a religion, <clears throat> died in 1883. He's still dead, buried in London. Charles Darwin, the founder of the evolution religion, <clears throat> died 1882. He's still dead, buried right there in Westminster Abbey in London. The Bab, they called him the Bab. <clears throat> Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i religion, died in 1889. He's still dead. He's buried in Israel. Jesus, the founder of the Christian religion, died in 28 AD, was buried here in Israel, but he came back to life three days later. He's still alive. That is the difference between Christianity and all the rest of them. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is risen, whatever men may say. So then opened he their uh, understanding. <clears throat> so Jesus is with them in the upper room. He's going through the scriptures and he's explaining to them like, oh, whoa, now I get it. I love that when your understanding gets open, that they might understand the scriptures. <clears throat> and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. We don't use this word behooved very often. Behooved means it's a duty, a responsibility for someone to do something. It's incumbent upon them. So it behooved Christ to suffer. He had a responsibility. He had to do this to pay for my sin. It behooved him. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name, in his name, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. We'll cover that in the book of Acts. Why do I want you to wait for this power? Because what the power is going to actually come be within you. See, when Jesus was with them physically, he could only be one place at a time. <clears throat> he went back to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit down, who can be in all of us. In us, not next to us, in us. He led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. So Bethany's there on the far right, probably two miles away. <clears throat> so he led them to Bethany, and he blessed them. It came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. A cloud just lifted him right up, and they watched him go up. See, Christianity is different from every other religion. We serve a risen Savior. 
and he can actually dwell in you. <clears throat> See, other religions, <clears throat> they have to study what their leader taught and try to get it in their head and try to follow a bunch of rules and regulations or whatever they've got for their religion. Jesus comes in us. These things have I spoken unto you, yet being, being yet present with you, <clears throat> but the comforter, <clears throat> but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, um, I got my, uh, <clears throat> he shall teach you all things <laughs> and bring all things to your remembrance. <clears throat> Whatsoever I've said unto you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. See, Jesus can come send his Holy Spirit to live inside of you. Now, that happens the moment you receive him. It's not a secondary experience where you get saved and then you receive the Holy Ghost. It happens at the same time. He, he comes into you. Now, you might not let him have all the rooms in your house, but he's in the house. It's a daily struggle for the rest of your Christian experience to let him have all the rooms, but he's in there. Some of you might have him in you, but locked in a closet someplace. Acts 1. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And while he spoke in these things, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. We'll get into that in the book of Acts. Romans says, Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. See, the Holy Ghost actually comes and lives in your heart. Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity. It means it's the enemy against God. Romans chapter 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. It says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. No other religion has this. None. The founder of our religion, Jesus Christ, sends his Holy Spirit to live in us. And he can guide you. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life. Verse 11, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, 2 mm, Corinthians chapter 4, <clears throat> for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. This body made out of dirt, has a treasure inside of it. Whoa. 2 Corinthians 13. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you're a reprobate. Galatians chapter 1. When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me. Galatians 2. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This is so different from every other religion. Galatians 4, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Ephesians 3, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. There's two Canthovens. There's the one born 67 years ago to my mom and dad, and there's the one born again 51 years ago, and they, in the, and they fight all the time. <clears throat> Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Hmm. Ephesians 3, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Now, hold, hold, hold it. I know you evolutionists believe in a one-dimensional dot, which is completely stupid. I mean, like off the charts, dumb. But... <clears throat> Here we have four dimensions, breadth, length, depth, and height. That'll preach another time. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. How can you know something that passes knowledge? You just know that you might be filled with the fullness of God. He can live in you. Ephesians 3. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all, we are able to ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. No other religion has this. Other people have to be made to adhere to their religion from the outside by force. If you don't do this, I'm going to beat you. Christianity is internal. <clears throat> Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Be careful, Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing. That word careful means full of care. Don't be worried. Don't be full of care for anything. 
<clears throat> and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. That's a cool phrase. How can something pass understanding? Yep. Walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith, not by sight. <clears throat> Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. See, he's, it's internal. Very different than every other religion. Colossians 1. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Wow. For, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. He wants to get inside. 2 Timothy 1. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. 1 John 4. No man hath seen God at any time. <clears throat> if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. I remember something changed in Kent Hove on February 9, 1969. For the next two weeks, I was afraid to talk. Because I used to curse and swear so bad, I'd go up and see my friends at school. I'd think it through in my mind first before I'd speak. Hi, how are you? They'd look at me funny, like, what's the matter? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Something's changed. Something's growing inside. <clears throat> if you haven't had that, you can have it today. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. 1 John 4, we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Back in the book of John, chapter 11, Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, and his sisters were arguing with him about it. And Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. This is the verse people often use. It doesn't quite have exactly this meaning, but it, it can be applied this way. It's like Jesus is knocking on the door to your heart. He wants to come inside, but he won't come in unless you ask him. You know, you can take a seed. I don't have a seed here, but take an apple seed or a peach seed or any kind of seed. That seed knows how to make the whole tree. How does that little tiny apple seed know how to build a tree? It does, doesn't it? Yeah. But it can't do its job if the dirt won't let it in. If you take a seed and lay it on the table, it'll never do anything. Dirt is 100% stupid. Dirt doesn't know nothing. But if you poke a little hole in it and put the seed in the dirt, now the seed does the magic and grows the tree in the dirt. That's what happens in Christianity. You receive Jesus inside of you, and he starts growing a whole new person in there. Yes, sir. The last part of that's very strong. I will sup with him, and he with me. Almost as equal. Yeah, sit down and eat supper together. We're buddies. It's awesome. So he, he's knocking on your door. He wants to come in. If you've never received Christ, I'd like you to make today, February the 16th, the day you do that. And write that date in the front of your Bible. And say, today I received Jesus. Now, when you plant a seed, you can put the seed in the dirt, put some water on it, stand there and look at it. What are you going to see? Nothing. But within a couple weeks, oh, hey, there it comes. Something will change. Just let the seed do its work. Luke 24, the last verse. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So since Jesus is in us, he can lead you from inside. How many have ever been really confused in life and don't know what to do? Got a big decision to make. Would somebody please tell me what to do? Give me some advice. Lead me. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. But first, he's got to be inside you got to ask Jesus into your heart to be saved. You can ask him today. This could be your spiritual birthday, the day you got born again. Here's what I prayed, February 9, 1969. Now, there's no magic prayer, 
But I just simply said, Lord, I am a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm guilty. But I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. Would you please come live in my heart and save me right now? That was it. And over the next couple of weeks, I said, oh, no. What is happening here? <laughs> like when a woman gets pregnant, you know, after the next next 60 days, they're like, oh, no, there's something growing in there, right? <laughs> oh, no, what's going on? Everything starts to change. First, you got to let Jesus come in. He, re he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me. Some of you that watch this program, you need desperately for Jesus to lead you so you quit making dumb mistakes and messing things up in your life. Amen. Get him inside and let him lead you. He wants to lead you. <clears throat> to lead you in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He wants to lead you. Pastor Hiles tells the story, Jack Hiles, First Baptist Church, Hammond, Indiana. This lady came to him to his for some counseling, and she was kind of half a bubble off a plum, you know. She was had some real serious psychological problems, and she said, Pastor, there's two men following me everywhere I go. Everywhere these men follow me. What can I do? Help, I can't sleep at night. He said, I can show you who they are. He opened up his Bible to Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. He said, that's goodness and mercy. What are you scared of them for? For the rest of her life, she'd open the door and let them come in, set two places at the table for them. <laughs> goodness and mercy. Come on in, guys. Have a seat. You want the Lord to lead you? Get him in your heart. Then do what he says. It's not complicated. All right. Any questions on the book of Luke? If you want our slides, we'll get them available here soon, and you get the whole presentation and share with your church, Bible study, anything. Any questions from this group before we run off to Chinese? None. All right. Come join us at Dinosaur Adventure Land in Lenox, Alabama. If you need to get a big map and get a big magnifying glass and find Lenox and come on see us here. It's a lot of fun. It's great. All right. See you in, uh, Monday. The, the Wacken Atheist, we're going to have to maybe do two days a week for a little while to get caught up. I got so many that need whacked. Dave, 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 I can't believe you don't get it, son. You're not getting it. We'll help you. Okay. We love you. We want to see you saved. You can ask Jesus in your heart, too. You Italians are a little hard-headed and hot-blooded. They, they make great Christians when they get saved. One of my best friends in school was Tom Pisano, an Italian guy. I led Tom to the Lord, my, one of my first converts after I got saved. Tom became a pastor. He's still pastoring a church in Peoria area. Tom led John to the Lord, his best friend. John and I went off to Bible college together. But those Italians, if you can get up through the hard-headed... And that's, they make great Christians. Dave, we'd welcome you to the family. Come on down to Dinosaur Adventure Land. Anyway, uh, want to go to Chinese? Taking off in two minutes, getting something. Let's go. Bye. <clears throat>